like to thank Orca Media for filming tonight's event. And I'd like to let you know that you can sign up for our newsletter. There's a list going around. You can also follow us on Twitter or Facebook to learn about upcoming author events at Bear Pond Books. Our next event is Tuesday, October 29th. We will be hosting farmer and author Kristen Kimball for her new book, Good Husbandry, Growing Food, Love, and Family on Essex Farm. And also, please save the date for November 1st. We will be hosting a party called Gin Austin. It's a literary costume and cocktail party with Bar Hill Distillery. They will be here with specialty cocktails from a book called Gin Austin, which is uh, 50 cocktails of the novels of Gene Austin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, local author, it's, it's so funny. If you come, though, you have to be in full guard. Um, local author M.T. Anderson will be hosting that event. And I think he's going to be wearing a suit from 1770. Thank you for coming tonight for the reading and book signing with our dear friend Reuben Jackson. We are thrilled to host Reuben to celebrate the release of his much anticipated second book of poetry, Scattered Clouds. This collection of new and selected poems is a breath of fresh air. A celebrated jazz scholar and black man in America tells it like it is. And with such rhythm and blues, you might be moved to mm-hmms. Or if it's more your fancy, amens. Poems as tributes to Trayvon Martin and Frank Sinatra grace these pages as do odes to cancer and Miles Davis's kind of blue. But it's not all blue, though, as Reuben's heart and wit shine through. Mm -hmm. What I love most of all is his final poem in the collection, the Af This African American Life. Um, it's, as I mentioned earlier, a breath of fresh air. And I hope you all enjoy his reading tonight, and more importantly, support this poet by buying his book. Uh, Reuben will sign copies after the reading and Q&A. A little true story about Reuben. Uh -oh. after, graduating, <laughs> after graduating from Goddard College in Plainfield just a few years ago, right? <laughs> he came to work at Bear Pond Books. No, I wanted to he work. He wanted to work at Bear Pond Books. But unfortunately, his mother didn't approve. And Reuben went into teaching. I think ultimately this was a good path for him. But we're happy to have him back at Bear Pond Books now this time on the other side of the bookseller counter, mm -hmm. which is where he truly belongs. Mm -hmm. Reuben Jackson was born in Augusta, Georgia, and grew up in Washington, DC. A music scholar and critic of national reputation, he was archivist and curator with the Smithsonian's Duke Ellington Collection from 1989 to 2009. His music reviews have appeared in the Washington Post, Washington City Paper, Jazz Times, Jazz Is, and on National Public Radio. He was host, as most, most of us probably know, of Friday Night Jazz on Vermont Public Radio from 2012 to 2018. And he makes frequent appearances on WPFW, Washington, D.C.'s publicly supported radio station dedicated to jazz and justice. Please help me welcome the poet, Ruben Jackson. <laughs> Uh, thank you all so, so very much for coming. I've, I've said this to a couple people here beforehand, but I don't know if you had this experience. Like, I liked summer camp because it got me out of the city for a while, and my parents would get the brochures around March. Summer camp was like June. So I would be thinking, can I curse a little bit? It, it won't be too bad. Um, <laughs> I'd be like, damn, it's only March. When is June coming? And then April would sort of come by. Damn, it's April. I mean, I was just anxious. And my, my point is that I was so anxious for this event. So this summer, I'd be like, oh, OK, 
nine weeks, you know, seven weeks, and tell the president not to start any crap, because if it's like World War III, I can't make it. I gotta get to Montpelier and do this. So I'm so thankful to be here. Uh, I'll tell you just a little bit more about the, the Bear Pond thing. I um, When I graduated, I did tell my parents, like, I want to stay here and work at Bear Pond Books. And my mother was, uh, she was more loquacious than my dad. But I said it, and there was what I call, like, the great silence. <laughs> and I knew that this is not good. And she put her hands on her hips like this, and she said nothing for a minute. And then she said, baby, you know how much your college education cost? <laughs> and that was it. Like, there was, like, the silence was the ellipse. And I knew that meant that I wasn't going to do this. But, you know, if you think about, like, it's a wonderful life. <clears throat> you know, one decision can change everything. It could have happened. These books might not have happened. I probably wouldn't have met many of you. So I'm, I'm thankful for what is. Mm -hmm. And um, just one thing about Vermont, and, and um, then I'll read some poems. I was here seven years, and, and uh, with all the challenges, I cannot, you all are like, also like my family mm -hmm. and you can't stay in a place seven years and not be impacted mm -hmm. so I you know like I go to work there was an opening at the university and I'm, so I'm getting dressed nicely for this thing and I look in the mirror and I get like a Carhartt jacket on <laughs> <laughs> and, and people in DC think that said I won't use the actual word he said, he said damn you Vermont is and I said, yeah, yeah so I'm probably more you know, seven years here, like, I'm glad to be home because I miss seeing myself. Uh, but I also lost a step, so I, I, I miss space, and I miss seeing so many of you, but I'm glad that you're here with me tonight. And it sounds mawkish, but you're always in my heart. I'm a quirky MF, but, but you are. You're in my quirky heart, you know? Okay. So this book, Scattered Clouds, um, it consists of my first book, Fingering the Keys, which came out 28 years ago. Like, you know, darker hair, no bald spot ago. My family's alive, you know, all that. And you realize when you're putting a book together, so there's Fingering the Keys and newer poems, that a lot of life goes between poems, which is, you know, my mom would say, yeah, Reuben, men always speak the obvious. But it's true, and I look at the landscape that's so different now. But what I'll do is read a bit from, the, or as a kid say, the old joints, and then some newer things. But I want to talk to you all and with you all, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. And if, I really hope you like the book. It is, um, I guess like my life in general, flaws and all, it's, you know, it's from here, okay? Uh, I'm gonna start, forget the chronology stuff, I'll just, it's like when you go to, back when they still had jukeboxes, you just start pushing songs because you love them, so <laughs> one would be like 1957, 2003, whatever. Um, this poem's called April 1975, and it, it, um, it's based upon something which happened <coughs> Well, we all know, like, C.P. Dudley's in East Montpelier. Mm -hmm. you know, I was a student at Goddard. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, I mean, you all know this. When I was at Goddard, like, in the 70s, if I saw another person of color, I called every relative I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I like, damn, I saw a black man in Barry. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, maybe it'll be on the news. But it was news to me, right? <laughs> so this poem is based upon that thing. I don't, that hasn't changed. There was a, I was in Julio's as a black waitress. She, she smiled at me first and I said, damn, you beat me too. So not, I'm not mad at y'all, but you know, it's, okay. Um, oh, my Southern Baptist has come out tonight. All right. April 1975. Should my black flatlander eyes lock on the other brother in the general store? The first brother I've seen since what seems like I can't count that high. Do I pretend I don't see other people pretending not to see us? Mm -hmm. Two brothers buying Triscuits and peanut butter respectively. 
is revolution on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> now, um, I'll take you to my neighborhood, which if you've been to D.C. recently, you know, it's like gentrification on steroids. So this is kind of, um, there was an essay Allen Ginsberg wrote for the book Visions of Cody, Jack Kerouac, which came out after Jack Kerouac died. And the, uh, the first sentence in uh, Ginsberg's essay read, Mortal America is here. So this is like old black D.C. is here because it's, you know, it's fading like landlines. And it, <laughs> but I come from that. And when I lived here and, and shit was bad, I tell people, I'm not from here. And they say, no, you're from D.C. I said, no, you don't know what I mean. I wasn't talking about geography. I was talking about, you know, that which, um, as the Baptists say, that which raised you up. Okay. So this is White Flight, Washington, D.C., 1958. When we moved to D.C., uh, my mom was a teacher. She had a, and... Uh, so black people start coming up from like the Carolinas, Georgia, and my friends and I call it the weekend of moving vans because white people go, whoosh, whoosh, and say, oh, remember so-and-so? We need somebody else for basketball. Oh, they moved last week. So, um, but thinking about it from the perspective of a child, and you know, like you're, I forget the comedian who said first I was a child and then I was black. So that's um, a bit of the fuel in this, gas tank at this <laughs> White Flight, Washington, D.C., 1958. No more densely freckled girls looking dreamily at the leaves passing by the window. No more playmates staring quizzically at the Negroes on my father's album covers. Sarah Goldfarb reminded me of a girl I saw in an old MGM movie, even though her father said that that, like my crush on her, was impossible. Rocco Quinzani was a dead ringer for Fabian. Who and where was I? Um, when, yeah, I taught high school in Burlington for two years. And, you know, you get to school early and you're getting not just desk straight and all that, but you're trying to get your head into the, into the game to come, you know, like first block is 8.05. And I would think about guys I grew up with, uh, some of whom are still here, many of whom are not, and I think, like, what would they think about me being here? You know, some of them would say, like, damn, Rube, I don't know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, this was a kid who grew up on my block, and I don't know if you all had nicknames in your neighborhood growing up, but this was Little Man. You see, we had, like, Little Man, we had Light-Skinned Man, who was, you know, light skin. Uh, there was Big Man who was big. But before you need specificity, you know. And you realize that when you hear the president speak, it's like, damn, there's no specificity. Right? Um, little Man, September 1963. There's a cloud in your head you try and conceal. A cloud just like the kid up the street who lives on the porch and broods like a seven-year-old Jeremiah. The occasional domestic fist fight punctuates the weighty sentence he has become. One day he calls you over and asks about the books you always carry. He wants to know if you know what people are whispering. Are you lonely, he asks, as if he didn't know the answer. He knows you know the lyrics to his song. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Um, this is a kid. Why do I say? You know, okay. Jimi Hendrix is now considered, you know, he's like an icon, like a, one of the architects of, I think, great expression. But he was controversial, you know, and, and in the late 60s, growing up where I did, you know, stuff was going on in this country in the late 60s, not, uh -huh. not like the sort of virtual revolution that we have on Facebook when people say, this is unacceptable. I mean, like, <laughs> shit was being burned, right? <laughs> um, so there was this kid named Frank who really loved Hendrix, and he sat in with this band, uh, and this is, like, what happened. Frank. 
Frank was fired from the El Diablos for inserting Hendrix licks into their celebrated James Brown medley. <laughs> there was silence as he bent to unplug his wah-wah pedal. Metal tongue banished from their world of matching suits and rote precision choreography. One year later, the ghetto was teeming with posthumous interest. Frank's door was bruised from all the knocking. With that Friday, the El Diablo stood waiting for his skyline of amps to come down. <laughs> um, I work for the University of the District of Columbia as a, an archivist, and I see young people I could not be, you know, every day. Uh, this young man came in, do some research the other day, and he had like a, a Nirvana t-shirt on, right? And UDC is a historically black college and university. And so I'm seeing this young, this young brother, I said, I said, man, you know, when I was growing up, if you had like a Hendrix album, you put Hendrix album under like the Supremes at the Copa so you could get home without people teasing you. <laughs> and, um, I said, you know, I'm your Jackie Robinson. Because, like, I took shit so you could wear that T-shirt. <laughs> but he didn't know what I meant. <laughs> Which made me cry. Because I thought things are a little better. You don't have to be as guarded as we were, you know. Um, I see not just people of young color, but young black people on the subway. Like, nerdy, geeky, geeky dudes. Talking about, like, um, did you see the new Marvel blah 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 and they got like high waters on and I'm thinking my god they had their butt kicked so fast <laughs> but their hearts are so open and it just you know I put my head in a book so I don't get all like crazy emotional but it's, it's a serious thing you know and uh, and I think these days to measure any degree of social progress or positivity as we used to say is good Anyway, now you know who I am. So, uh, this is another uh, Vermont-based poem. My first slow dance, uh, well, I did a lot of slow dancing with myself before, you know, in the basement, uh, happened here. And it was at a party, and I thought, wow, you know, I would come to Goddard, and people would ask me, they'd say, well, what's, how do you like school? And I'd say, it's all right. But I was able to talk to people, fellow students, about things which really mattered to me, which you didn't, like, say to your boy. So we, you know, people in the dorm, we stay up late reading the Mil Zola novel excerpts to ourselves. <laughs> I mean, I was like, I bloomed, but I always had to put it, always put it back mm -hmm. when I came back home, which, which is, it's not good to live your life like an accordion, you know, like, this. <laughs> it's, it's, uh... And I didn't say, you know, oh yeah, my first uh, first slow dance was here, but it's this, so this is based upon that event. Pivotal year, 1970. <coughs> Trish gets in the general store, slow dance. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Phil. Okay, no, sorry. <laughs> 1975. It was a long way to go for a party. 90 minutes from Canada, moon just above my right hand. Mm. It was winter. She was a school teacher who smelled of jasmine. Stevie Wonder sang looking for another pure love while Jeff Beck spun gorgeous fills and solos. We danced as well as our cumbersome boots would allow. Mm. <laughs> I bought I bought a pair of, well, they call them Tim's now. I bought a pair of Timberlands here. I forget the name of the store down here on, on Main Street when I started Goddard. And I went home for like a week in this, quote, spring. <laughs> I went to the barber shop and people I walked in and they looked at my feet and said, what are you wearing? Like, those are the ugliest boots I ever saw in my life. Well, you look at now, people wear Tim's like 24-7, all year, rappers and stuff. And I tell people, when I, I did after school work in D.C., I used to tell kids, I was the first black man in D.C. to wear Tim. <laughs> no, I said, no, I, I was. You know, I, I said, people weren't this before, you know, P. Diddy or all those people, no. I said, and not just because I'm older, you know. So 
people, <laughs> sacrifices had to be made. <laughs> You're your producer called Timbaland. See, that's what I mean. I just sit in the house and shake my head. <laughs> if they only knew. All right. Um, my... The older I get, the more... I guess we're all like variations on the theme as far as, you know, parental influence goes. But I'm more like my mom every day. And I think, I hear things pop out my mouth and I go, oh my gosh. <laughs> my mother was much more loquacious than my dad. And she had definite ideas about things like not working in bookstores after you graduate from college. <laughs> and uh, she also... She is very middle class. She grew up in, like, like a brownstone, you know, back when he was born in 1924. Black people, there weren't many black people I knew of like that. And sometimes you want to go play ball outside. Say, no, Reuben, you have to learn which forks to use for the dinner we're having. <laughs> I mean, oh, God. Uh, but she also thought, she believed in social change, but she thought, you should look nice when you do it. She said, you, you can't. And this is like my mother in the afterlife. And it, you know, you probably know I was never in GQ magazine here, but uh, my mother in the afterlife. It's 1970 again. My mother is shaking her head at the sight of my clothing. She never abandoned her dream of a world without denim. <laughs> now there's no escaping her critique. You can't have coffee with God looking like that. <laughs> she rolls her eyes at Abby Hoffman and at Bill who owned the head shop near our house. Death has restored her mind. Now she's talking curfew. My brother laughs behind the cloud. <laughs> I'm going to read this African American life, which is is the last poem in the book. After I left Vermont, February 2018, and which is not a long time ago, but my life has always been like dog years. Like a lot seems to happen in a year, and a lot has happened since I left. A lot happened when I was here. I mean, I I had like seven dog years here, you know, and and it's just. I don't know, whoever sets the tempo for us says, yep, this is how your band's going to play. <coughs> but I remember just um, kind of recuperating and really reveling in comparative anonymity. Um, there is, I don't know, hyper, hyper visibility can be, even if nobody's bothering you, you know. So um, these are some vignettes which popped up after I returned to D.C., this African American life, and the title that take off on the the uh, the NPR show, This American Life. I always said I wanted this show called This African American Life. And kept like, okay, this week, bean pie makers from Chicago. Or whatever, you know. uh, okay, one. I hope I live as long as the nails of the sisters sitting beside me on this crowded subway. <laughs> two. I've decided I'll propose to the next brother who calls me main man. <coughs> Three, if a middle-aged black man enters a subway car and no one stares as if my people were new to the planet, hell yeah, my soul makes a sound. <laughs> Four, my late friend Joanne appeared in a dream. She told me Jesus fainted when I went back to church. <laughs> okay, there's one more about my mom. Uh, this is, I didn't, I mean, the only dating I did in high school was when I'd go to Safeway and get like dates from, you know, aisle <laughs> seven. And my mother said, like, well, what's up with you, you know, of 1973. This also refers to like landline and calling the weather bureau for, because you know, I would fake it, pretend like I was talking to, you know, I don't know, Pam Greer or something. <laughs> 1973. 
My mother peers over my shoulder in search of answers. Please say you're dedicating that poem to a woman you don't seem to know any. <laughs> Listening to Ella Fitzgerald does not count. <laughs> so I think of someone, call her. She says the wind's blowing from the south, southeast at 15 miles an hour. <laughs> the barometer is 30.7 inches and rising. Yeah, I whisper, wear that strapless French number. <laughs> See you at 8. <laughs> you know, I'm going to, here's a, another one with like a Vermont connection. I, I started messing with characterization uh, and these <coughs> characters or vehicles. Amir and Khadija began to take shape. And, you know, you're on Facebook. I just kind of think out loud on social media sometimes. And it apparently these characters began to gain a following. Mm -hmm. And um, Dan Bowles from Seven Days emailed me and said, you know, I'd like to do a story about these characters. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, but, you know, I'm just the, I'm the narrator. Like they, Amir, the, the barber, would mm -hmm. tell me, write this down, because he's so busy cutting heads, he couldn't do this, and he knew I liked words. But, um, so this story was published, which maybe some of you saw, and after that I go to like Shaw's, and people recognize you. This, I was at the uh, deli counter getting like egg salad or something, and this woman said, well, Mira and Khadija had this romance, you know, and this woman said, you know, my husband doesn't like poetry, but I read him some of the stuff Amir said to Khadija, and he started crying at the dinner table, and she said, I'm pulling for them. And what I learned was, you know, your work t can take on a life or lives of its own. Uh, and I thought, well, I need to put, I mean, I could say, it's not really me, but the degree of, I think, emotional candor and, and tenderness was different for me, I think, as a writer. So I'm glad I was able to capture these things. So what you have is a 70-some, 80-some-year-old barber and from Detroit. And then, you know, he meets the CEO, Khadija Rollins, and they, they fall in, you know, what can happen to people, right? These first three poems are three haiku from Amir about Khadija and, you know, things are starting to sort of bubble up here. Three haiku. Who will be the first to save syllables and utter the sweet obvious? Mm. I would rather be conspiring to hold her hand before the moon <laughs> dies. Mm -hmm. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> When Khadija smiles on a mild spring afternoon, my old heart blossoms. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these, uh, Amir would just write, Dearest Khadija. So this is, Dearest Khadija. To touch your face is to feel my fingers pray. Mm -hmm. August 1st. I thank the moon for the light on her pillow, then whispered her name. Untitled. She is a buoy in the harbor at dusk. Dearest Khadija, the other night as I was driving home, I reached my free hand across the passenger seat. I imagined you holding it before the light changed. Then I returned both hands to the wheel. I found a parking space two blocks from my apartment beneath a large maple. Lord, I love this city, and turn to kiss you anyway. And this is Khadija's nocturne. This was for Amir. She went to a lot of <coughs> conferences, so you know, you're out of town. Hmm. We share the same night, even when we are distant, consoled by the stars. And I'm going to yeah, I'll stop with this one, and then I hope we can, you know, trade fours, right? 
This is for Trayvon Martin. And what I did or tried to do, I was here, it was my first year teaching at BHS, Burlington High School. And um, it's an interesting, challenging circumstance. I was the black English teacher, which for some was a description. It was also, uh, I think, a qualitative kind of ranking with folks. So this murder happens. But I also, I thought about that, of course, the fact that this murder occurred, but I thought about growing up and how my friends and I would walk each other home because that's what you did. And, you know, the whole thing with masculinity and you care, you love your friends, you don't say it, but it's like the action, you know? Like people have that stereotype about <coughs> New Englanders being staid and no emotion. We taught ourselves how to be like, you know, I call it the honor guard face. Mm -hmm. So my fantasy about this boy, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but I just said, damn, I wish I could have walked him home like we walked each other home growing up. <coughs> you know, this for Trayvon Martin. <sighs> Instead of sleeping, I walk with him from the store. No Skittles, thank you. We do not talk much, sneakers crossing the courtyard, humid southern night. We shake hands and hug, ancient stoic tenderness. I nod to the moon. I'm so old school, I hang until the latch clicks like an unloaded gun. All right, so there's some poems. Thank you. And uh, anybody? A lot of people. Oh, thank you. That teach them Ferris Bueller's day off. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> Are there questions for Ruben? Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess not. <laughs> Comments? To yes, please. I have a question. How did you get into jazz? Do you perform? Or are you an appreciative audience only? Or how does it work? My. Family, my, my parents love music. And there was all sorts of music in the house. I mean, a lot of us. See, one thing about, I love about Vermont, like the demographics are such that you don't have to explain what things like record clubs were. You know, <laughs> like my parents belong to the Columbia Record Club, and we get classical stuff, country, jazz. Um, my father really loved jazz. There was a, a little club in our neighborhood, and he and his buddies would go a lot and they'd also play records in the basement and drink really cheap scotch and I would I'd sit at the top of the steps I'd hear the music but I'd hear them talking about the the artists who played which was also a great um, what entry into what language can do like they'd say things like oh you know like the saxophone is Cannonball Adderley was playing one week and the guy said what was that that stain on Cannonball Adderley's lapel I think I think that was like from you know like the egg food young he got from the Chinese joint blah 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 <laughs> but, but that's where I heard a lot of music but I would also say music music kissed me very early you know I could I could read music very early and I thought like my parents would give me hell because I didn't do well in math but my father would say, like, we can put a score in front of you, and you can read it, but you can't do math. But it was because it was in me, and it was also, like, if you're driving someplace you want to go, like, a score is a journey to someplace. But that's really where it comes from, you know, just the love for it. I and, miss you on Friday nights. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really, that was a great... Um, a great opportunity. I used to bug my friends. You know how people, like we all played like the hit records back in the day. And I was the one who flipped, I'd say, turn on the, over the B side. There's like a, there's a cello counter line in the fifth <laughs> me measure. They go from B flat to D flat. And my friends are like, oh damn Ruben, please don't start that again. <laughs> so that's, the show gave me an opportunity to burn off 
a lot of passion. I mean, a lot of nerd nerdiness, but a lot of passion. And I still hear from people here um, who just tell you stuff that I don't know. I could make a lot of money for Kleenex. I just cry. Like <laughs> people would say, "Yo, oh, you know, I counted on hearing you on know, Friday nights." It. I used to take a broomstick as a kid and pretend I was on the radio, <laughs> but I never would have dreamt, you know, this. But I'm glad it happened. Mm -hmm. See, I'm Southern Baptist, I guess. <laughs> Anybody else? Just, yeah. uh, I, I loved, uh, yeah, I do miss your show. And I loved, uh, when I first moved here um, years ago, uh, yeah, it was such a relief to, like, turn on the radio and, I think that's a black man. <laughs> and and I, I love your um, your mix. I, I, I love and I, I I share the same passion. I'm sorry. No, no. But no. I, I I share the tears because I was living in the kingdom yeah. when I was listening to you. And there would be many a day when you you and I were the the, the two black people I knew. Yeah. And uh, but I, I love the your your mix was the mix I grew up with. And uh, for all the love of, of Dolphin or Miles yeah. Yeah. and I think particularly like in, in our generation, right, right. you know, there was also James Brown. Yes, and, yes. and Marvin. Right. And I love the way in a jazz format, the way you would mix Marvin with Kamasi Washington, which is appropriate because it's all, you can't hear Kamasi without hearing the whole history, uh, which I think is so important with, with jazz as in poetry. It's all, a, it's a collection of voices. Thank you. I used to say, some of you probably know Kamasi Washington. I did a, his version of WC's Claire de Lune, which became like my <laughs> sign off piece. And I said, this is, it was like French Impressionism meeting the Urban House Party with like the little <laughs> blue light bulb. And I thought of people who would ask the really, 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 really fine sisters to dance. People like me, they keep saying, like, hell, no, you must be crazy. <laughs> but, but it's like that yearning and stuff. Uh, and you know, what I tried to do was uh, illustrate you know, intersections and how even musicians who are, quote, called jazz musicians listen to much more than that which you know, we consider, like, okay, jazz starts here and stops there. But, uh, and then the influences, as you know, are so fluid. Because, like, Marvin Gaye loved Lester Young. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there, we could go on with that all night. And I, uh, I, I will say, what the Archie Chef who went to Goddard, the saxophonist, said, uh, I passed through the insipid panorama of Americana with an enormous romanticism. It has never left me. And so I was guilty, certainly, of that as a programmer, because that romanticism would say, like, mm -hmm. come on, man, play another ballad. But I had to, you know, it's tricky because the show was for you all. It's not like I was making cookies for myself in the house. <laughs> but thank you so much. I did my best, you know. Hey. I saw you another. Like you. Thank you. <laughs> I saw a hand of the Can you tell me about how poetry and jazz, so how do they dance together? For me, yeah. I was thinking about this the other day. I think initially, well, the first poets I heard, and I'm using poetry in a big, big, you know, different way maybe, <laughs> were like the old AM DJs with that rapid, you know, banter, uh, ministers, and there were people in my neighborhood who could take I won't utter like my favorite expletive, but they could they could turn it into a sonata, you know, like just the beauty, that the fact that language can describe, but it is musical. Um, so I thought 
about that when trying to write. And of course, in, like in Fingering the Keys, there are more pieces about jazz musicians and their references. That is still there, I think, in me, but it's also, I try to focus now on just the jazz in speech, you know, and how you've got inflections and, and you know, I won't use the, the expletive, but, you know, MF, which is not mezzo forte, <laughs> but <laughs> like Butch, light skin Butch could take it and he would say, Lucinda, you seen Bobby? You know, this is, Bobby owes me $40. Mm -hmm. If I see that MF, well, that's trouble. That, that tamper is trouble. Or in so-and-so, like my mother's beautician was a guy named Cordell who had, you know, behind the stations, behind beautician's chairs. He had like 99,000 pictures of Sam Cooke. And he would say, Miss Mary Sam Cooke was at the Howard Theater last night. And I think I thought I was going through male menopause. I mean, he said something. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the way he would speak in the language. Uh, so hearing, and I would go with my mom because my father worked on weekends. I'm this kid sitting there. And it was kind of funny. My mom was kind of strict Baptist in a way. And I'd say, Cordell really likes Sam Cooke, doesn't she? said, yeah, I think the Orioles are playing ball at one. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to talk about that, you know. But even my point is the connection between what music can do, you know, instrumental music, if we're thinking of what's called jazz, and how language can achieve the same thing, you know, in terms of emotional uh, impact with just the sound. I tell writing students to, you know, read your stuff out loud as you're working on it just to hear how it sounds, not just in terms of you know, whether it makes sense, but also just to uh, revel in it. Like, what's that old movie, The Sound of Music? You know? <laughs> I said, or like, swish it around at your mouth, like, like not like the stuff we used to drink in the alleys, but, but like good wine, you know, like, oh, there's a Chablis in the third stand. But, but that's, yeah, it's, it's the quest for uh, the musicality of speech. Mm. Mm. Wow. Thank you. I must be in Vermont. I'm like this. <laughs> it's a good thing. Yes, ma'am. Well, just to add to that subject a little bit, I recently read uh, Jorge Borges' essay on <coughs> blindness, and he said that his blindness led him into the oral world and caused him to go deeply into learning two new languages. Mm -hmm. One was wow. Anglo-Saxon, English. The other was Icelandic. And he said that this was a gift hmm. that caused him to hear the sound of words that he could not hear in his own native language, Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so I equate that a little bit with what the best poetry can do it's our language, it's English, yeah. but it presents that language in a form in which you hear the word, you hear right. the sound and the rhythm besides the whatever your subject is. Sure. So uh, it was really cool, I thought, yeah. Yes. Good point. I know we have to... We can move to book signing unless there's any other questions. Why are you going to record this so that we can hear it over yeah. and over and over? Yeah. Yeah. Is there an audio book in the making of the world? Come on. over to WGDR, we'll fix you right up. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Talk about roots, you know. I'm serious. That's a, no, I know. That's a great suggestion. I, uh, do it. One, Do thing it. My aunt, <laughs> one thing my aunt told me after this book came out was, it's my father's last sister. She says, like my mom, she starts like six with baby. She says, baby, you can't wait another 28 years for another book. <laughs> I said, yeah, my math is that good. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good idea. I mean, I, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm thankful that I was approached to do this. I hadn't really, I'd started kind of writing a bit more regularly when I had poems in the, the voice here, you know, my filial voice.
Hmm. And so little by little, I don't know, things sort of evolved. But I, I think what Fats Waller said is just spot on. It's like one never knows, do one. You know, mm-hmm. I never knew. Well, any of us. <laughs> but but uh, okay, one one. They say one more. Whatever you want. Okay. You All right, we'll close at midnight. And we'll just hang <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. You're all good. Okay. Okay. Could, could you tell us where? You came from in D.C. and why you came to Goddard? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up in Northwest. You, are you from D.C.? Well, I've lived there. Okay. I lived uh, in Brightwood, which I think the real estate people call something else now. Mm-hmm. But I was east of Georgia Avenue, mm-hmm. south of Tacoma Park, mm-hmm. um, fifth between Ingraham and Jefferson. So that's... Uh, yeah, it was predominantly Jewish, and then uh, well, like that poem by Robert Hayden, which is like the synagogue became New Calvary. So it was you know, and um, why I came to Goddard? I was at a party, and in my family, college was not an if; it was a where. It's like you were going, and in the living room was like the old Saturday Review of books and there was a I'm flipping through it because that's what you do at a party right music playing people having a good time and you're looking at the damn sad even your books um, but then I saw a, a blurb about Goddard and it sounded like a place that would like like the snow would stick metaphorically speaking and so I, I asked the person who was throwing the party if I could just rip the thing. He said, no, just take it, take it home. And I shared it with my parents. My mother understood, well, I guess both my parents understood me, but my mother understood I'd start trying to write and all that stuff by then. And she said, this is a possibility. My father wanted me to go like someplace like Notre Dame because he was a pragmatist and he thought, you know, yeah, you can, yeah, you can do creative writing if you want to. You're not coming back home to live when you graduate. <laughs> um, but this was right before eleventh grade, and my mother said, "Oh, don't worry, I'll work on it." <laughs> and I ended up, it was, you know, coming to Goddard. It was the right place for me. Uh, I started radio, and I was a little bit like a fresh air kid in a way, and that I. I also had these MGM romanticized uh, views of places where you come out the house and people would try to take your money and stuff. And I thought, you're looking for that land and it looks like those, um, what, those train sets with the gazebos and the, the choir is singing outside. Uh, Andy, Andy and Opie, right? You know? Uh, boy, was I naive. But anyway, um, but most importantly, I did. You know, I was reading stuff on the download, James Joyce and the Bhagavad Gita and stuff like that, mm. and I'd hide them. So I didn't have to hide, you know, in that respect at Goddard. And um, it, yeah, it, it, the impact profound. And I, I, people, you know, you tell people you went to Goddard, and they, they say, oh, yeah, you made it in basket weaving and all that. This is a chick some serious behind. And uh-huh. I was at a conference a few years ago talking to somebody about about Yates. And they said, where did you learn all that stuff about Yates? And I said, Goddard. And so they're waiting for the punchline. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not, I'm not joking, you know? So that's how I got there. And I was the first person on my father's side of the family to go to school. So eventually, when he got behind it, it was this quiet but fervent, you know, okay, go and do well. But my mom was like the one calling Sunday and saying, you have enough blankets and stuff? And, and my father was like, how are you doing in classes? You know, he still didn't quite get how he got in classes. Went. <laughs> okay, don't fail that Dylan Thomas. <laughs> Whatever it was. But, but um, yeah, bless them both. I wouldn't be here. Without, without that. Mm. One more. I said, yes, sir. Yeah. When exactly did you start uh, writing poetry, and how did you get over the embarrassment 
of thinking it was really, really bad. <laughs> you know, I still have. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, uh, I'm sorry. Will you finish? Go ahead. Um, you know, and uh, how did you your develop? How did you develop as a poet? Wow. <laughs> I'm still developing. My tenth grade homeroom teacher was um, editor of our school newspaper. I never said anything about writing. And one Friday, she came to me and said, we need a poem for the next issue of the paper. So I said, well, who are your favorite poets? I thought it was like an assignment. Jeez. Go and get some Dylan Thomas and bring one in. And she says, no, you write it. And I'm like, what kind of setup is this? <laughs> so I deliberately tried to write the most mawkish poem I could. It was like they had typing classes back then. Oh, yeah. a uh -huh. sister who sat in front of me, she had one of those flawless, um, like Roberta Flack on the Chapter 2 album. Yes. You know, like <laughs> Angela Davis, flawless afro. <laughs> so I wrote this poem called, like, Ode to the Sister with the Most Perfect Afro. Uh -huh. right? And I thought, well, this is going to get me off the hook. Because it was, <laughs> it was heavy sugar. <laughs> so I turned it in and Miss Middlebury said this is great you're staff poet I get a poem every month <laughs> uh, well, damn like I messed up <laughs> but I began to enjoy it now the embarrassment part yeah I think it's like anything playing an instrument you fall on your butt uh, you go through periods of overt Imitation, you know, people who really strike you. I wanted to be like Frank O'Hara for a long time. Mm -hmm. And there's a poem in the book which was an attempt to do what he called the I do this, I do that poems. Mm -hmm. uh, I think time mm -hmm. is like the best teacher, healer, whatever mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Having, there was a teacher at Goddard who was really, really rough. And I turned, you know, I shared this horrible poem at a workshop and he just like it was scalded he just scalded <laughs> and I saw him on the path going to the Pratt Center the library and I tried to I just went the other way <laughs> and the next day I saw him in the cafeteria and he said Reuben if I was writing the crap you were writing now I would have gone the other way <laughs> <laughs> but it made me mad so, yeah, I'm going to say this very simply way. I, I got mad. Um, I think I'm still developing. I enjoy things I hated doing in college. Like, I enjoy revision. Because it's like you're in a room and you think, well, do you want the Anwar here? Do you want it there? And I'm not as hard on myself when something doesn't. Mm -hmm. You know, you write a draft and maybe what you've got is half a decent stanza. I always think of it as maybe like the foundation for the house or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, and I have friends who will tell me, and you think, yeah, this is, you know, boy, when they hear this, this is bad, you know, good, bad. <laughs> yeah, and they say, uh, rude. <laughs> and that's it. And I know it means like it's not, I took it out the oven too soon or whatever. <laughs> but for me, the joy is, is just, in the exploration, and if you have a day when it's not so great, pick it up again. Um, I do think, for me, would you say tragedy? I don't know, losing people, getting older, it's helped me with perspective, you know. And uh, since, you know, this book came out, my nuclear family is gone except for me. And that, so, you know, it makes me think, eh, it could be worse, you know? <laughs> but but uh, it's the possibility. It's the possibility. Like Patty Smith said, the yeah. sea of possibilities. Mm. Whew, mercy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.